our whole thinking has changed now into understanding that the more diverse we have of the ecosystem, the less likely we are to get outbreaks of different pests and diseases. So now, instead of reaching for a drum of something to kill things, we're, we're actually trying to promote things more to create more life. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Stokely. Today we get to speak to Mark Gardner, a specialist in regenerative agriculture. It's pretty incredible our conversation because we talk about how the land management happened 60,000 years ago and how it happens now and the problem with how we manage the land now as farmers and as a community. So where do we go from here? What's the future hold for us if we keep working the land the way we have? And what could the future look like and the benefits that that has for the human race essentially if we start to implement techniques and methods such as regenerative agriculture. I tell you what, it does touch on benefiting the climate, climate change, people's health, community health, farmers health, animal health, land health, it's all in there. And it's pretty amazing what we could do if we just stop for a moment, look at what's happening and then decide to keep going in the way we're going or maybe make a pivot and do something a little bit differently. So. Everything is in the podcast and I really hope you enjoy it. I really enjoyed the conversation and I learned a lot and I really am taking it on board in the way I go about the things that I do. So enjoy and before we get into it, I'd like to take a moment to thank the traditional custodians upon the lands which we gather, listen to and created the podcast and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. And I'd like to invite you to join me in paying respects to the beings everywhere that keep the law of the land. We've got a lot of work to do when it comes to creating healthier ecosystems and we can make a difference whether we're a farmer or we're not. So enjoy the podcast, reach out to us if you have anything to let us know about and uh, that's it at Stokely Podcast and we look forward to hearing from you. So please enjoy. Thank you. G'day Mark. How are you? Oh, I'm great, thanks, mate. How are you? I'm really well, thanks. What's happening? Mate, I am, well, I'm doing a lot of research on regenerative agriculture, actually, in my uh, situation being that in heightened restrictions in Melbourne. I am conscious of your time, mate, and so I figured I figured with an expert like yourself, we, we could probably look at diving pretty head-on into it and... I'd, I'd like to start by just maybe getting a little bit of a background on your 25-year history within the space of uh, regenerative agriculture, or maybe not in that space exactly, but the journey that brought you to, to where you are now with your business and the consulting that you do in that space. Sure. Well, I got churned out of the Melbourne University Ag Science uh, Factory uh, a few years ago and uh, with an honours degree, and I then... Um, worked on a number of properties in South Australia and um, in the Riverina of uh, New South Wales. And I was always interested in sort of sheep and pastures and I was sort of like the ultimate generalist back in those days. Um, so after a couple of years working on properties, uh, I took a job as an agronomist uh, for a, a large pastoral company that owned, I think, about 16 properties. And I used to travel from hay right up to graft and advising on sort of crops and pastures and grazing management. And, um, you know, we grew a lot of irrigated crops. And, uh, you know, I think probably the first thing was handling all the chemicals really started to, a light bulb went off to me, even though that was my whole background in science. You know, these things are pretty toxic. And look, to be honest, most of them aren't on the market anymore. So, you know, um, it was like, gee, yeah, and, and just seeing the impact on on the humans and on the on the soils, I think, was was the big thing. And um, I left that uh, job uh, as an agronomist and became a farm consultant here in Dubbo, uh, working for a company called Hassel and Associates, which were very well known and, and quite large at that stage. And I came across this book written by this fellow called Alan Savory, and um, Someone gave it to me and I read it and I thought, I couldn't understand it. Um, but it was talking about all these things like ecology and ecosystems and biodiversity. And, you know, I'd never learned that stuff at university. I think we'd had one lecture and it was about forest ecology. So, 
you know, it just didn't seem to think agriculture was ecological. That was sort of like the greenie or forests or other things. But it really got me thinking because it clicked into a lot of things I'd seen about native grasses and introduced species, about life below soil, about diversity of life, and it really resonated. So, you know, that that became the 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 sort of aha moment for me. And um, I went across. Uh, we'd just been married not that long, a couple of years, I think, and I think we just had our first child, Emily, and Cassie was pregnant. And I said, "Hey, mate, I need to go across to America and uh, you know get accredited with this holistic management stuff." And she said, "Yeah, sure." So you know, I w- then went across a number of times and worked closely with Alan Savory um, and became accredited as a holistic management educator. And that's probably 25 years ago. And then since then, I've been running, working with very closely with landholders, commercial landholders, and running courses and, and implementing a lot of and adapting a lot of Alan's thinking. And, you know, most of our farmers are mixed farmers, commercial scale mixed. They have sheep cattle, a little bit of cropping, and uh, pretty much spread through New South Wales. Um, so that's basically been our, our business journey, if you like. Wow. So can you just, um, so when you say that, so you're farming um, sheep and cattle, that's for meat, is it? I think, uh, uh, well, that's a really good question. Uh, I would say nowadays most of our clients have merino sheep and and the modern merino is both a meat and a wool breed. So um, they have a dual purpose. Uh, and cattle, are, uh, um, yeah, for beef, yeah, for meat, yeah. And then when you refer to to crops, you're talking about like wheat, um, barley. What's what kind of crops are you normally working with? Yes, it's most of the winter cereals: wheat, oats, barley, a um, bit of triticale, uh, a little bit of canola. But a lot of our clients now are moving into sort of more multi-species cropping, where they're selling a range of species at the one time. So, you know, they're really starting to evolve a, a more adaptive Australian way of cropping, which is very exciting. And so does that, does that product, when it gets farmed, is that, is that stuff that the people in urban areas and everywhere else, are they eating that? Is that their, their food? That, does that stay in Australia? Like how, what's the life cycle of that? Yeah, well, the, the wool, um, it's really interesting. I've just... Uh, this morning had a Zoom call with Uruguay uh, about some uh, some uh, wool brokers that are really fascinated about the whole concept of Regen Ag and really want to source wool produced from regenerative farms because it really links in with what a lot of fashion consumers want as a not just sustainable but a regenerative product and they're really looking for that. So, you know, that's finding its way through the the supply chain now right back to the farm. So I reckon that's awesome. Um, I think grain, you know, and wool is a very much a high value type product in the fashion industry. But, you know, I really believe that the grains that are being produced off regenerative properties, I believe that the nutrient density and, and the composition of those grains is different than, um, you know, just more more traditionally produced grains. And I believe there's an opportunity, market opportunity, to differentiate some of these sort of bulk commodities based on nutrient density and their forms of production. But, you know, we've got some really, really good boutique um, uh, millers and and producers of sourdough breads and different sort of produce really starting to want and source grain from regenerative farmers. So that is absolutely exciting because that is people that are eating food saying, hey, Every time we purchase something, we're making a, a, a we're sending a message, and the message we want to send is that the way in which this food is produced and the impact on the landscape is important to us. So you know that's not a government policy type thing; that's a co- real commercial type uh, market working to create a better outcome for everyone. Well, I think that is uh, something that's becoming very very common, and um, I guess that's what really is one big element that leads me to have this conversation with you. But I think I want to touch on that nutrient density and how that whole thing comes to life essentially. But I want to take just a step back and and go back to that point you mentioned about the chemicals that you used to work with and the effect that it had on people. Can you just speak a little bit to that and what, like, 
what that means? Like, what was your experience with that and those chemicals? And what do you mean by the effects that it had on people? Yeah. Well, I think I think the first thing is that you know we never back in the day. You know, one of the great things about Alan Savory's work is that when you have an outbreak of a pest or weed, you know, he's he sort of gets you thinking about what well, what is the cause of that. You know, why is that pest or weed there? And and to start to address the causes of problems rather than the outbreak of problems. And, you know, I think the first thing that, that you know, coming from a very strong science background is if there was a problem, there was a technological solution to it. And, you know, it came in a, a, a different uh, uh, a different type of chemical. And, and that was the, you know, and I think that thinking is still very, very strong at the moment in a lot of industries. So, you know, I think um, our whole thinking has changed now into understanding that the more diverse we have of the ecosystem, the less likely we are to get outbreaks of different pests and diseases. So now, instead of reaching for a drum of something to kill things, we're, we're actually trying to promote things more to create more life. So you get this buffering so that, you know, army worms have natural predators that also have a population and they suppress each other. Um, and we're finding a lot more uh, value, if you like, and a lot lower input farming through more natural systems. So, you know, that would be the first thing that we've learned is that natural systems uh, often require less inputs because nature provides some of the inputs. We don't have to provide them all themselves. And I think that happens for fertilisers. We have, um, you know, bacteria that fix um, nitrogen from the air and make it available to plants or we can apply it in a fertiliser. Uh, mycorrhiza fungi um, in the availability of pea. Well, we can, if we can get our soils healthy and rich in fungi, um, then we can rely less on phosphate fertiliser. So, you know, the first point in answering that is to understand our, our thinking, our regenerative thinking has changed, um, how we our attitude towards chemicals. And I often say to people now it's, Regenerative thinking doesn't say no chemicals ever or no inputs. It's we want to have a really reduced reliance on these things over time um, so that we're only using them incredibly strategically when, when there aren't natural solutions or when we want a quick outcome for whatever reason. So, you know, that's the first thing to understand that whole concept around the causes of problems and understanding the ecosystems. Often those problems we see is an ecosystem out of balance. And if we bring an ecosystem into balance, we have less of those problems. But certainly back in the 80s, a lot of the chemicals that we did use, you know, it was it was almost like a straight line. You had a problem, which drum, which colour drum did you use? Um, now we rarely use those chemicals at all. And, um, you know, a lot of the chemicals that were in use right back in the 80s were quite toxic and, and a number of them aren't used anymore. They're not available on the market. So, you know, I think best practice keeps changing. That's one of the big messages that what what seemed to be safe today in 20 or 30 years' time, you know, um, it's often only in the hindsight of some of these longer-term impacts that, that we're seeing that. So that's why I really like about regenerative agriculture. It has far less reliance on these sort of inputs that, um, the consequences might only be seen 20, 30, 40 years down the track. So, you know, I think more natural inputs, more natural farming means we're going to have less of those sort of consequences down the track. And, you know, that's what Regen Ag is all about, if you like. It's such long-term thinking. You know, we need to move away from this year or this crop or five years. We need to start thinking, you know, our children's children, what will be the consequences of this activity or this input on our children's children. And when we start thinking long-term like that, I suspect we come up with a whole different range of, uh, of ways of doing things. So what, what kind of consequences are you talking about? Um, well, it was funny. I was just talking to someone the other day. You know, it wasn't that long ago in the 70s and 60s when, when farmers were encouraged to pull out trees to, to create more productive areas. And it wasn't until, you know, 20 or 30, 40 years later that farmers were paid to put the trees back, you know. Um, these are, <laughs> And it sounds crazy with the benefit of hindsight, but that's what happened. You know, farmers were paid a bounty to apply very high rates of 
fertilizers in in the 60s with the superphosphate bounties and 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 a lot of soil acidity happened in those years um, now they have to put lime on because they put too much fertilizer on you know and and these are the the patterns that we get around when we're not thinking long term and when we don't understand that when we disturb an ecosystem in a way, there's a long-term consequence. And when we think long-term, we start to think around, well, if we do that, what are the long-term impacts and consequences for everything that we do, not just chemicals, it's, it's for all our farming practices and the way we live our life. And, you know, I think if we start thinking that way, we, we start to do things differently and um, with a different perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... Just to take one more step back, there must have been a tipping point or something because none of this existed, you know, before, say, settlers came to Australia and, and you know, decided to colonise it. So was, you know, if we, were to, if we were to look back and the First Nations people, the traditional custodians on the lands of Australia, did they farm in a regenerative way or would you, would you even call it that? How did they oh, manage is. the land? Oh, you know, and, and I think, you know, boy, uh, this is something I'm really passionate about at the moment. And, you know, I think that uh, Bruce Pascoe's book, Dark Emu, is an absolute must read for every Australian. Um, you know, because, you know, let's be honest, the history of uh, pre-colonial Australia that I was taught at school uh, doesn't have a lot of its uh, basis in fact. Um, you know, and I know in that book, uh, Dark Emu, I think there's 21 pages of references. So, you know, that's a really quite solid reference document um, going back to Explorer Diaries and stuff like that. So, you know, I think what, if we're going to have a, a way of feeding ourselves in Australia and the world, we have a lot to learn about Australia, and, and I'm absolutely convinced that pale-skinned European folks, such as myself, really don't understand much about Australia. And if we really want to understand a little bit about Australia, um, we can certainly go to uh, Aboriginal folks and First Nations people because, you know, they were doing that for probably 65,000 years before us, you know, and I think they've probably got a few more runs on the board about understanding regenerative agriculture and long-term sustainable than what we do with our 250 years. And look, let's be honest, we haven't really done uh, a fantastic job of, um, of uh, positive change on the landscape in 250 years. Um, it's been quite damaging our agriculture. So we sure can, you know, and I think through that book there, I'll never forget, I drove out to Broken Hill not that long ago and the book was resonating in my mind because um, there were some pictures of what they called the grass people who used to live out around Wilcannia. And if you drop out through Wilcannia now, there is so much bare ground, red bare ground, and the only place you can find a perennial grass species is just on the, t the table drains, the runoff of the road. You know, but that, the early explorers spoke about the grasslands that were out there at Wilcannia. You know, the kangaroo grass and Aboriginal folks that lived there used to harvest that for grain and they used to make bread out of it. And, you know, they were probably the first bakers, um, you know, and, and they used to store that grain and carry them over into dry periods. And, you know, we have an, an incredible history of agriculture in Australia going back 65,000 years for growing grains. Um, around Bathurst, which is not far from us, there's some wonderful creek flats and Aboriginal people, they, there was a village there of maybe 3,000 people on those creek flats. And, you know, the history of uh, that I was taught was Aboriginal people were hunters and gatherers. Well, that's not actually true. You know, they had villages and they used to dig for yams there um, and uh, Murnong and, um, you know, and, and uh, aquaculture, um, both up around Brewarrina on the rivers up there and also down in Victoria with their eel farming, you know. And there's wonderful stories about, yes, we, we have some great stories and great heritage uh, through our Aboriginal brothers and sisters of how a, a, a truly regenerative approach to agriculture happened in our country. And I think what we need to do is to, to take off our ego and our pride and, and start to engage with Aboriginal people 
Engaging in this instance means listening. And we have two ears and one mouth, so we should listen twice as much as we talk. And um, you'll hear great things uh, from Aboriginal people about uh, landscape. And, you know, coming from Dubbo, I have a lot of Aboriginal mates, and, you know, they talk about Mother, Mother Earth, you know, and, and wouldn't that be great if agriculturalists and farmers started to understand, treat the ground like it was your mother, you know, and I'm not sure people would be really happy pouring on high rates of herbicide on their mother uh, or some of these other practices, you know, and it's just a different way of thinking about what land is. And, um, you know, some of these are just themes that sit within regenerative agriculture. Yeah, it's, um, it's I'm, I'm really glad that you've brought up um, Bruce Pascoe's book, Dark Emu, because I haven't read it myself yet. I've, I've definitely read a lot of articles that relate to it and speak to what it is about, and it sounds incredible. Um, some of the, as you mentioned before, some of the, um, you know, the accounts of history that he covers with the native grass and, and the bread baking and, and things like that is just, you know, as a, as a 32-year-old Australian to only hear that in the last six months that, you know, the yeah. First Nations people were like the first bakers in the world. It's, it's, to me, it's just, it's ridiculous. It's, um, yeah, it's really hard to comprehend. It makes me think why, why do we not know more about this incredible history? And yeah. I've heard a lot um, about it through other conversations since and hearing things like, you know, there used to be underground ovens that they used to bake in. And now that these underground ovens used to sit one and a half meters below the the soil level, and now these ovens sit like one and a half meters above the soil level because of all the topsoil that's been swept away and and um, just completely destroyed because of this this process that you um, referred to before with the fertilizing and and the desertification of all the all the lands that we've got out here, and that just mm. um, yeah, that just makes me think, wow, what a like you said, how how much damage can we do in 250 years when when they've looked after it so well for 60,000 years, you know? Um, yeah, oh, absolutely. And, you know, when you read the, the Explorer Diaries and you go out, particularly in the Western Division, and you see the erosion uh, caused by overgrazing, um, you know, it's just tragic. And, and yet mine can only go to what it would have been like, you know, 100 and probably 130, 140, 150 years ago out there um, where, you know, it would have been amazing. So can we reverse what has happened and can we take it back similar to what it was? Ah, I think we need to be thinking about taking it forward rather than taking it back. Um, okay. Now, because I think a lot of land... Alan Savory talks about the concept of brittle landscapes, which are landscapes that have rainfall that are deeply seasonal and they're, they're not humid throughout the year. Like if you think around sort of a desert or a broken hillway versus the east coast uh, a forest, you know, where it's humid and warm and versus it's not, you know. And, and I think in those uh, brittle or arid landscapes, I think process is very slow. But, yes, we can absolutely change them in a positive way. Um, and, and livestock have a very, very important role in doing that, but they need to be managed differently. And this is where Alan's idea about the graze uh, and recover cycle is so important so that animals move through the landscape grazing and then there's still a suitable recovery period so that the desirable species can germinate and establish before they're grazed again. So, you know, my control and grazing is so important out there and that's a function of time and animals um, in terms of the exposure of the plant and animals. So that's a very powerful principle about controlling that exposure between plants and animals. So those desirable animals aren't overgrazed, uh, plants aren't overgrazed, the animals move on. And I think understanding um, the basis of, uh, those perennial uh, plants and understanding that that controlling grazing and using the animals as a tool to rehabilitate that landscape 
gives us wonderful possibilities uh, for for a lot of those brittle environments. And certainly in the non-brittle environments, we can certainly move landscapes to be more diverse and more functional, you know, a little bit easier because we have more rainfall and humidity, um, which, you know, the biological processes are a lot quicker. So, yeah, we can absolutely, and, you know, I think there are some great case studies. There's a little bit of stuff starting to get published now about how we can uh, rehabilitate and restore and regenerate some of these landscapes. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I'm very glad to hear that. And, um, and I hope it's <laughs> important, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it seems like quite an important thing at the moment. I have read a little bit of um, uh, Mr. Savoy's work and I, I do remember him saying that only livestock can save us. And then he, um, in the article it goes on to say um, that he believes grasslands hold the potential to sequester enough atmospheric carbon dioxide to reverse climate change. And as you just said, it's, that's, that sounds pretty important to me at this point in time. Oh, look, it's huge. I mean, particularly for your generation, th this is critical. This is absolutely fundamental that everyone understands this concept, that photosynthesis is the key to life on the planet. It, it, it's what gives us food. <laughs> you know, it, it's what creates timber and structure and um, you know, it is just so important as a process and, you know, it should just be taught to kindergarten kids how important plants are. And it's not just plants above the ground, it's also what's below the ground that's vitally important. And, you know, we have farmers that have started their regenerative journey that might have, in just simple organic matter terms, under 1% soil organic matter. And within a few periods, uh, a few years and a few cycles, that might up be around 4 or 5%. And that's really common. Uh, you know, they're big, big turnarounds in, in soil organic matter. And, you know, the carbon measurements on those, that's a bit outside my field, but they're very substantial. So what perennial grasses can capture and store below ground is quite substantial. And, and I think, you know, wherever we can put two leaves where there were one or three leaves where there were two, that's going to make a massive difference to drawdown. And at some point of time, someone's going to come up with a whole concept that plants pull out carbon dioxide from the air and use water and use sunlight energy as the power source to create carbohydrates and oxygen. And that is the process of photosynthesis. And the input to that is carbon dioxide. So, you know, we can have all the technology around the place, but at the end of the day, it will probably be the humble green leaf that makes a difference. Yeah, amazing to, to put it like quite simply, really. Um, and not to mention the fact that um, plants are our partners in breathing. We breathe out carbon dioxide, they breathe in carbon dioxide, and then we breathe in oxygen and they breathe out oxygen. So it's like they work in exact partnership with us. You know, they, they breathe out what we breathe in and they breathe in what we breathe out. And it's like, if we don't have that, then we ain't living much longer. That's for sure. That's a big note. So, you know, I think um, just understanding that the humble green leaf is the thing that's going to make a difference to humanity. And we need to put more green leaves on bare ground. And we have too much bare ground and we don't have enough green leaves. So the more diverse green leaves we can get, the better. Yeah. Oh, 100%. I want to touch on um, how much work you've, you've been able to do with, um, you know, farmers from the, the recent fires. And have you been able to incorporate some of your work in the, in the regeneration of the farmlands that were lost through bushfires? Yes, we're working on a, um, an industry program, working with some of the bushfire impacted families. Um, so, yeah, I, I think a lot of them are, well, sorry, the ones that we're working with, I think, are really starting to, um, through that tragedy of the fire, really starting to think about how they're managing their farms and, and what their goals are. And... Um, are really um, questioning and, and open to looking at different ways of doing things. So, um, yeah, look, it's a very, very slow start for the landscape. 
uh, for the biodiversity and also the people and the business. So, yeah, it's, it's a lot of hard work going in and uh, those folks need a lot of support for a long time. Um, and so will the ecosystems, I think. What is it that people can do to to help with, you know, actually regenerative agriculture as a whole? You know, if, if there's people that live in the city and they really are not, mm. they're non-farmers, how does mm. how does the feedback loop come back to farmers, and how do how do um, non farmers help out in that sphere if it's so important to all life that exists on Earth? Oh, look, um, we all eat food, and and we all need food, and and to me, the the, the most powerful thing to send a message is be very um, discerning what you're buying and where from, and. You know, there are some really fantastic uh, suppliers of ethical grass-fed beef from regenerative farms or lamb or eggs or chooks, uh, wool, milk. There's a whole range of produce now that is produced regeneratively. And I think a fantastic thing would be for neighbourhoods to gang together and to put in some bulk orders um, and, and which makes it just easier for the farmers with the logistics of transport, um, you know, where you might be able to buy a, 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 a whole animal cut up in boxed. Um, it's easier to deliver that than, you know, eight or ten people or more buying their own little bits. So, you know, ganging together, if you like, in an informal way and putting in bulk orders, that to me sends a really powerful message to the producers and creates demand for their produce and tell people the next thing is buy your own food regeneratively and then tell other people because, you know, we've been buying our beef from uh, some of our clients for, I don't know, decades. And when people come around to a barbecue, they'll often say, gee, where'd you get that steak? It's really good. And I tell them. And, you know, a lot of them go and, and buy their own produce from regenerative farms because They've had that experience. And, you know, I think this is something we can all do is when we go and buy food, be discerning where it's coming from and how it was produced. And if you like it, tell people and create demand for that. And if you don't like it, tell the producer because they like that. They want to know that, that if something's not right, they want to make it right. Um, and, you know, I think I think that's the most powerful thing we can do. Um, source out regenerative food and and gang together in little groups if you can just for logistics tell people about it and the, the next thing is stop buying stuff you know just stop buying stuff you know buy what you need and that's all you know and be very creative about buying less stuff because if we buy all buy less stuff that's a good thing for the planet um Absolutely, yeah. I've I've had the um, pleasure of talking to a couple of companies that are, are definitely working on that um, consumer reduction element of the human psyche, really, and trying to yeah. encourage people that that before you even buy something, just take a second to think: Do you really need it? Because mm. that's that's where the real that's where the real the most impactful choice is it's not about what you buy or it doesn't matter how green it is or how it's been made and where it comes from it's it's whether you should or whether you actually need it um and i feel like yeah. that is that's something that is gonna it's almost a habit to just buy things and we're gonna yeah. take time to to work through not using that habit or not having that habit anymore um yeah. so so, Mark, if I, you know, if I turn up to your barbecue, I'm going to be honest, mate, I'm not going to be looking for a steak. I'll probably be asking, <laughs> I'll probably be like, hey, mate, have you, got, have you got a bowl of oats? I'm an oats guy. I love oats. Now, do you think you can yeah, do yeah. the same thing with oats? Sure could. Um, you'd have to let me know in advance, though. So. Okay. Um, Too easy. <laughs> yeah, look, we have, uh, we have uh, some clients out the road that, that produce a whole range of regenerative grains, spelt, buckwheat, uh, oats, triticale. Um, all sorts of different different grains. So, if you were to give me a little bit of notice, we could uh, absolutely <laughs> sort you out on that one. Yeah, I might. We might ask really, for your contacts really, on that one. Really great porridge, yeah, and maybe some grain, and you know, we could muck around and see what we could concoct in the kitchen. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, Mark, on on the ground level, when you first touch base, or within the first few interactions with a farmer who 
who isn't um, putting these practices into place. What are the things that you actually do in your process with that, those initial first, first um, instigations with a farmer to, to, you know, take them from where they are, the traditional kind of um, farming methods to a more regenerative agricultural um, program and process? Well, I, I think uh, with a lot of human endeavour, motivation is really important. Uh, so we, we need to work with people to understand where they're coming from and why they want to change and, and really get a good descriptor of what, what change looks like for them. And, you know, that's loosely called goals. Uh, goals and values are, are so important to really get those overt. And also one of the things we do is to start to think about them. Well, how do you want your landscape to be for your children's children? You know, what is the long-term consequences of, of your management and, and what's it going to look like? So they have a very clear vision of their landscape and, and they're very clear on, on what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, you know, and I think visualising and idealising that is very, very important, particularly if you've got two or three or four family members working together, you know, it's very important that we don't just sit in our own space and think this is what we're trying to do, but we share that in a family and we we, the first thing we try and do through that process is is to make a collaborative team, and uh, you know that that's that's uh, very very important that we do that. Um, so that's where we start. Um, you know, so why? You know, as Simon Sinek would say, why? Uh, and and we can look at what's and hows later. But why finding a why is such a fundamental importance for for the driver of change. And how have you, um, what's been the most common why that you've uncovered with a lot of these farmers and their families about why they might be considering a change in these farming methods that have lasted for generations with Australian farmers? Yeah, well, you know, I think there's a number a number of reasons. Some of them have health issues themselves um, and uh, have realised that that, the lifestyle and the way of life they're living and what they're eating, it's not healthy. So that's really got them, their own human health or, or, or the health of a family member has been an issue. So that's often been a driver for them. Um, and um, for others, it, it might be a, an epiphany, uh, might have been an accident or, or something like that that's really got them thinking. Uh, for others, it might be a natural disaster such as a fire um, or, or an economic disaster where they simply couldn't afford that high input agriculture. You know, so I think, uh, and, you know, some of them just have this feeling that what they're doing is not right. You know, they're observing things in the landscape and they're, they're acute observers and they're observing less birds and, and less species and more background. And, you know, they're observing that and they have a feeling that something's not in balance. And, you know, so there's... There's often a range of drivers, I think, but they sit around something like that. On a, on the the real practical side of things, say if you you know say if you had a a hundred hectare or sorry a hundred acre farm and it was it was farmed and you're growing um, beef cattle on it and um, you know it's been very traditionally cut up into paddocks and pastures and there's a lot of you know general erosion that's going on because you've had to divert water in in a in an unnatural way so to speak does does the farm start to look a lot different from the the beautiful long or the open rolling green fields like what are the huge differences that we can expect to see if we if we drive past a farm that's traditionally um managed compared to something that's um, done in this regen ag way? Yeah, well, that, that's, that's a really, really great question. What, what, should, what changes should you see? And I think also I'll just mention, firstly, it depends on the nature of the environment, you know, that brittle environment, more arid uh, versus the sort of high rainfall. So you'll see different things. But the general principles that people should be looking for are uh, no bare ground, 100% ground cover, 100% of the time. So that's certainly something, and not just looking out, uh, but looking down. When I was an agronomist, what I saw was proportional to ground speed. So if I was driving past a crop at 
60 kilometres an hour look fantastic. But when you walk over the crop and look down, you'll see bare ground. And, you know, I think that's the thing is to take time to walk over the landscape and, and look at it. Bare ground looking down. Uh, I would look at things like diversity of species, you know. Uh, we've got all the same plants. Is it a pure lucent stand or is it pure ryegrass? You know, we're looking for a diversity of species, summer growers and winter growers, cool season, warm season, um, legumes, grasses, introduced natives. We want a diversity of life because that supports the diversity of life above and below ground. Should we have to hear birds? You know, that, that's a very, birds are really fundamental and they're, they're really quite a key high order. So if you have lots of birds, they need lots of insects and seeds and, you know, that's quite a reasonable indicator. Frogs, if you're around water, you should be able to hear frogs, you know, because, again, they're, they're sort of top order things. Um, I would also look at water in the landscape. You know, in a healthy landscape, the way that water moves through it is slower. So you get more recharge and you get slower discharge. So, you know, you should be looking at streams that maybe run slower but for longer rather than a big flood and then they're, they're dry for a long period of time. So I'd also look at the riparian areas. that They should be covered right down to the water with reeds and, and water-loving plants. Uh, the water should be clear um, so it's been filtered through the perennial landscape. So the, these are the sort of things that people could observe. But what we don't want to see is landscapes that look like a bowling green because or a front lawn in Kew or something like that. That's a monoculture that's been very low, uh, grazed, uh, been grazed very closely in monoculture. We want to see a bit of roughness in the landscape, a bit of height, you know, and that's your diversity because in those tussocks, Bugs and critters live there, and if you don't have those and you've got this queue front lawn, um, you don't have the bugs and critters. You don't have see things seeding, so you don't have the birds. So we want to see roughness and height and different types of species, and we want people to say, geez, that looks untidy, doesn't it? Awesome. Um, you know, it's a bit more of an untidier landscape within reason. For, for anyone who doesn't. <laughs> Who doesn't know what Q is? Q is a very affluent sub suburb in Melbourne, and um, a Q front lawn would would be referring to someone's manicured front lawn that looks like a a, a uh, golf green, I suppose. Um, you could play and, billiards on it. <laughs> yeah, and they quite often drive around a, a Turak tractor, which also refers to a a four wheel drive Porsche or BMW. Um, well, that's that's really. You know, I feel like that is something that is um, just really simple to to visualise and to understand. And then, you know, hopefully people can then, if they ever are in an in a environment such as a farm or driving past a farm, start to realise that, wow, that look at those grasses, they're all just one type and they're very, very short and they do look like, a, as you say, like a bowling green and they are... Uh, that is probably not the kind of regenerative agriculture that we want to be aiming for in this country and, and the world. Is there a, a leader in this space in terms of a country or um, an industry that is um, really putting in some, some good ground and, and making some real movement to, to be a leader in, in regenerative agriculture at the moment? Who do, the, who does, who do you look to, to for... Um, for you know motivation and inspiration in this space i think uh, a lot of this work really has to go back to the source of, of alan savory um and his work you know he's the guy that's written the books and and done the ted talks and has really really opened up this whole discussion so in my mind he's you know, and he suffered so much because his ideas are so radically different to high input farming. You know, he's copped a real flogging over the years and he's stuck with it. And, you know, to me, he really is the, the you know, the, the, the leader in the field. And, um, you know, he's, he's getting pretty old and cranky now. And, um, you know, I, I think he's battled his life and he's an ecologist by training. And, you know, he was a great observer of landscape. So, Certainly, Alan and, and uh, his partner Jody have done wonderful things for international 
um, well-being. Um, you know, it's really interesting. I think here in Australia, we have some awesome leaders in regenerative ag, some amazingly good regen ag leaders, incredibly innovators, particularly around the grazing management field. But, you know, we've got coal size with pasture cropping and we've got some incredibly good regen croppers. Um, you know, we've got some incredible grazing managers. We've got some excellent scientists who, again, cop an absolute flogging from their peers. Um, you know, really not well accepted, but their work is fantastic. Um, so here in Australia, we've, we've got some uh, really, really good leaders. Um, you know, I think Gabe Brown over in the US, uh, in North Dakota there, really I think is a, is a fantastic leader in the cropping, you know, broad acre cropping. And what he's doing with focus on his soils and, and multi-species, uh, you know, he's awesome. And uh, if anyone wants to Google him, he's written a book, but there's some great YouTube talks from Gabe. And uh, he, he's got some, uh, he just makes it simple. And, you know, that's the thing, as Regen Ag, it's really simple. You know, I think traditional, conventional, high put agriculture, it's incredibly technical and, and difficult. Regen Ag is, is really pretty simple. And, um, you know, I think the, the, the really good practitioners are able to speak simply. Joel Salatin is another one that, uh, that uh, over in the States, who's done some wonderful thing on small acre and in intensive and, and producing food, quality food. So, you know, there's some uh, really good ones around the world, but we've got some great regen uh, agriculturals here in Australia for sure. Is there a, you know, like you spoke to it before about people getting together and looking at um, purchasing as a group bulk produce from regenerative farms. How, how do you, like, how do you even find where that is available? Are there... Are there websites that that showcase all these people and and what they're doing and and what's available from them to purchase? Like, what is there a system set up in place for that? No, there's not really. You know, I think farmers markets are a really a good place to start. And um, you know, depending where people are, there's a lot of farmers markets getting around now in Australia, and and that um, is a really good place to start. And I know our, our local farmers market have a, a, a website where, where people can uh, advertise on. Um, Google is a, is a good place to start too. Yeah. Um, you get that down in Melbourne there, Google, do you? Uh, but, you know, I, it's, a, it's a great place and I reckon it's getting a real workout at the moment. Um, but, you know, I think that's, that's a good place to start. And wherever you are, there's regenerative producers of a whole range of produce right across Australia now. And uh, it's just a case of finding them. And, um, yeah, farmers markets and Google are as good as places anyway. Yeah. I do remember um, also in that research um, that I, I looked into briefly on, on um, Mr. Savoy and his reference to um, his reference about this way of farming is, is not only going to help with climate change, but it also serves to minimise and eradicate things like poverty, emigration and the violence that we see in the world. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit to that? Because they seem very far apart, but I assume there's a, a very um, solid link. Yeah, well, look, I mean, Alan's a very global thinker, a lot more than I am. And, um, I mean, when, when so I'll have to bring it back into my sort of more Australian context of that, but, but I think the principles are very easy to see how it works. And, you know, one of the things, oh, I was up uh, north and I was on a property that uh, last generation had seven families living and working on the properties. This generation has got one. You know, and I think that's what Alan's saying is that, you know, the more we've simplified our ecosystem, it's hard for people to get a living out of these farms now. And, and you know, last generation when we had so many, and part of what the regen farmers are looking at is they can see ways that they can bring people back onto the land um, through these approaches. So, you know, to value add to their marketing means someone's got to do that. Someone's got to have the time. That might be a daughter that can come back or a son that takes over that part of the business and direct markets the produce. There's another job. You know, and they might have ultimately have a family. There's another family, and that feeds into the local school and the supermarket and the tennis club and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, I think these are ways that 
uh, through Regen Ag that, um, you know, when we heal these landscapes, they become more productive and it creates opportunities for people to actually come back on the land because there's nothing more soul-destroying the other day driving around and seeing these houses falling down that used to have families. You know, you can see the bones of a beautiful garden around these houses and uh, they've been abandoned, you know, and that's really, really tragic. So, you know, Alan's, I think when you see it in Africa, it's even more fundamental that when you can grow three leaves where there were two or put three plants where there were two, you can run more animals. And, and that, that's the difference between someone starving and someone living, you know, and I think that's, that's a way in which we can bring people back into the landscapes is through sustainable and regenerative ways long term uh, is, is to create more viable businesses by starting with healthy ecosystems. Wow, yeah, I can I can start to see how it all does connect in that in that way. That's pretty yeah. And, and, yeah. and the same with water, you know, when we've destroyed the water cycle, we're getting rainfall, it's running off very quickly in floods and taking topsoil with it. When we repair the water cycle, that same rainfall is captured and stored in the root zone and trickles slowly into the streams. You know, so we have more permanent water and we have more available water for the plant roots. So, you know, this whole sort of, these cycles interact, the water cycle and solar energy capture through ground cover and more diversity and mineral cycles, healthy soils, they all collide to build up into a virtuous, virtuous cycle rather than a, a vicious cycle that is simplifying. And, you know, I think Sue Ogilvy wrote a paper on that, those concepts, and I think, you know, to understand that Regen Ag is a virtuous cycle. As we produce, we improve things, you know, and, and the problem with traditional high-input agriculture, it's a vicious cycle. The more we put on, the more we have to put on, you know, and we simplify and it's driving it into a very simple and they're, they're different cycles. So, yeah. Yeah, and I can't help to think that if we have no ground cover, such as, you know, um, a diversification of plants with a, with a healthy soil and we get a lot of rain and that washes straight off um, into rivers and creeks, um, then eventually that's all going to the ocean, right? And I can't help yeah. but think that this kind of, this way of farming and this way of land management has a pretty devastating effect on the um yeah the the end of the line in regards to water which is yeah the the ocean and, and what that knock-on effect has yeah. well you know there's enormous projects going on to save the great barrier reef um from from sediment uh and and fertility runoff through through croplands and grazelands uh, and the government's putting a lot of work into capturing and storing uh, rainfall where, where it occurs rather than having it run off. You know, Matt, what you've got to understand is, is rain is the primary driver of photosynthesis. It's water, and, and it's that cycle of CO2 plus H2O, water, captured and stored in the root zone. So, you know, it's sort of like our primary resource is going away, and, you know, what Regen farmers understand is if we can capture and store that and hold it in the root zone, it's sort of like a free kick. You know, it's 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 easy that we can have a growing season that might be uh, nine months of the year, not six months of the year, because we can capture and store that moisture. So our primary production, our biomass production, goes up just by capturing and storing, and we have less damage downstream. So these things are very compatible when you work backwards. Um, you know, it, it's it's win 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 all the way along the line when we have eco healthy ecosystems. So you know, I think there's room for great optimism, but we we need people to be thinking differently uh, around how we manage our landscapes. And so that that brings me to think that um, that maybe the the situation that we hear about a lot in Australia with the farmers being in drought situations could somehow be avoided if the ground cover that they had on their farms was a lot more diverse and a lot more substantial because they wouldn't need as much rain to 
to be able to manage their farm because it would, wouldn't just run off. It would be held where it lands. That's absolutely right. I mean, you know, when, when you get your head around an ecological approach to agriculture, a whole lot of possibilities open up. I mean, the first thing is drawdown. You know, if you, if you can cover the soil with green plant material for longer over a 12-month period, you draw down a large amount of carbon dioxide. And if we graze in a particular way, we can store that in the soil. So, you know, the, 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 the big picture long-term aspects of, of that drought cycle you know, we, we can mitigate, not overnight, but we can start to make progress to draw down long-term generationally by, by doing that. The second thing is when we have the ground covered, um, you know, some of the climate predictions are we, we get a rainfall often falls in a more intense uh, rainfalls and then longer dry periods. And so you get more runoff if you don't have your ground covered. So... You know, there's little value in having 30, 40, 50% of what falls running straight off and two days later, nothing's, you know, the, the ground's dry, but it causes enormous damage by eroding, taking fertility and concentrating that fertility somewhere else. You know, so the whole idea about building dams, you know, that's coming right back to our first conversation about what's the root cause of the problem here. And it's the fact that we don't have healthy water cycles because we, we have too much bare ground. So, yeah, as we do that, that farmers are able to run properties on less rainfall if their capture and store ratio goes up, their, their efficiency goes up. So if you're a plant and you're in a 600 mil rainfall zone and half that runs off, you're in a desert every year. You're only in 300 mils. You know, if we can get that to 90%, uh, that's 540 mils. That's a huge amount of extra rainfall that that plant can have. And that drives out enormous gains in, in sort of productivity um, that can, you know, feed back into the ecosystem and uh, all sorts of things. So you're absolutely right, you know, more effective water cycles, better ground cover, better cycling of nutrients, you know, there are only good things come out of that. And, and that's where we need to start to look at our policy in Australia is to start to hit that sort of ecosystem level. And I don't think we're doing that at all very well. And, you know, I think, therefore, the impacts that we're likely to see from our expenditure is likely to be a lot less than the fundamental impacts of covering the soil, having less runoff and having more diversity in, it, in our uh, landscapes. Um, you know, I think the payoff of those is huge. And so with landscapes and areas of land in that kind of health we're talking about animals also consuming uh, more nutrient rich feed and we're also talking about crops that are growing in more nutrient dense soil which then allows the end product the food the grains and the the meat that people yeah. eat to be more nutrient dense because it essentially mm -hmm comes from the soil being brought back into good health with its population of microorganisms and and the fungi that you speak about and all of that kind of stuff so that's the end product for people that are that are living in a city who are not farmers and that never see a farm or go near a farm the the end product mm -hmm. is that because the soil is healthier the food that they're buying which comes and is grown from that soil is going to be much more nutrient dense and better for the human body, right? Sure is. And look, you know, if, if I could say really one thing about food that people don't understand at all is that a lot of the food, particularly the meats, uh, whether that be pork or chicken, beef, lamb, you, you really have to look at how that's produced because a lot of our meat in Australia is feedlot finished. And, and what that means is animals are fed huge uh, a high carbohydrate diet to finish and you know if I could be blunt it's sort of like eating the biggest loser that tv show you know the, the composition of the fat changes uh, whereas animals on grass pastures that's a different product totally and if you look at the research about the omega-3 ratios the omega-3 ratios which are very important to human health particularly mental health you know, the omega-3 ratios from grass-fed 
uh, beef or lamb is very similar to salmon and fish. Um, the omega-3 and, and the other ratios of omegas, fats, in feedlot is way out of whack. And in fact, it's probably not that good for you, those ratios. So, you know, I, uh, some folks don't eat meat. That's fine. That's their choice. But just to understand, meat is not meat. It's different products. And grass-fed meat, there's a real story around the omega and, and the linoleic acids and a whole lot of other stories that have a different composition than feedlot beef. Um, you know, and, and always look for grass-fed, not, not, you know, it was on grass and then feedlot finished. Always look for grass-fed. It's a different product. And particularly if we can get grass-fed off regenerative diverse pastures, that's another product too. So, you know, I think uh, through, through the whole range of richness from a healthy soil, and, and, and the nutrient density of the plants that, that are growing in that soil and there's an input into the animals, it's a totally different product than often what you'll find in the supermarket. And I probably, you know, I, I know uh, with a lot of our organic clients who do the BRICS monitoring and all sorts of other things, that I think that's absolutely the same for plants, you know, and, and some of the plant-based uh, diets that we have. If we can get plants that are grown, not just organic, but from regenerative soils, I think, you know, the nutrient density and the composition of those is probably going to be a bit better for us too. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, yeah, what a, what, a, what a great thing to aim for. Um, so just on a final closing note, mate, how, how much needs to change, and you just touched on it before, at, at a policy and governmental level to to really see this get scaled, um, yeah, it's scaled up so most of the farms are operating in this way? Well, I, I think there has to be an absolute fundamental change in starting from our education system. And you and I had a yarn about we, we don't even know the history of Australia, so how can we manage the landscape, you know? We have to teach kids the truth about the landscape. We have to teach everyone that. You know, we have to understand an ecosystems is what we're managing, not an input-output system, you know, and that changes our way of looking at agriculture. You know, agriculture is a massive business. You know, it's like I often call it the agro-industrial complex. It's worth billions and billions and billions of dollars. You know, the regenerative sector doesn't get a lot of research. It, it, it doesn't. You know, it's, it can be a very lonely sector to work in because you're, you're talking to big business who have lots of money, um, you know, but I really think that governments have to look at their whole sort of education through to their advice that they're giving uh, to farmers uh, and through to their research. Why don't they fund regenerative agriculture? You know, why isn't it funded to the same level or, or why don't we have a cooperative research centre for regenerative agriculture? We do for beef and the different industries, grains. Why don't we have it for regenerative ag? And, you know, I think there's a lot of pushback, you know, when you follow the money trail and a lot of these things that, you know, because if you're using a lot less inputs, you know, a lot of people don't like that. Um, you know, and that's a big industrial complex there that, that doesn't like that too, that's invested a lot of money in showing that, that you know, if you kill something, then that's a good thing. Uh, you know, and I suppose we're trying to promote things that want to live, uh, not kill things, um, you know, and it's, it's sort of the antithesis. So I'd like to see a lot more going into education, a lot more into extension and advice. And we need to get some funding. And, you know, the other thing is we need to look after those poor researchers that do really good research into regenerative agriculture because their peers can be terrible. You know, that, that whole research industry, I think, and, and that, that, that uh, culture of research is, is not very conducive to good quality um, um, research. And, and I think we need to start to research the things we don't know rather than looking at incremental changes to the things that we do know. So, yeah, if I was in charge, Madge, she'd be changed overnight. <laughs> well, mate, it's, you know, looking at what's happened with uh, this um, situation with the coronavirus, it's, it's pretty obvious that things can be changed overnight, yes. essentially. Yes. 
in in the grand scale of things. Um, let's just hope that the that the voice of the people is loud enough to 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 get those changes in place. Um, yeah. But I yeah I, ha I have to agree with you, mate. And I I really can't thank you enough for for parting with your knowledge on this today because it's been so insightful and um, some real good takeaways for everyone to just really understand what they can do in their own homes to to make a bit of a change to to help support re regenerative agriculture and uh yeah and, and that whole space mate so um yeah how can people get in touch with with you and and the work that you do because um i've i've met you through the wild idea incubator which has been a, a great program a nine-week intensive program and um and yeah, you're you're in there because you're you're trying to spread your ideas and, and get them out there to the world. So, so how can people um, contact you for for a bit of a high nutrient dense oats? Oats. <laughs> Look, they can go to our website uh, www.vbs.net.au, and uh, they can read a little bit about our work there, and and they can contact me through that website if they want to. And, um, yeah, look, it's been great to have a yarn. And how good has the Wild Idea Incubator been? It's just been awesome. You know, not, not just to work on ideas but to work with people and meet people of the quality such as yourself. I mean, it's just been awesome. It's been great. Yeah, it really has, you know, and, and it's through conversations like this when you start to realise that, you know, holy crap, there are a lot of people out there that do think in the same way in regards to mm. we need to we need to start focusing on biodiversity and conservation and and different ways of going about what we've done because the model that's been handed to us and that's been in play for a number and number of years really isn't working and um, unless we no. unless we come up with a new model we're not going to change anything because the old models produce this so far and and it and it's only going to produce the same BS that's been handed to us so yeah mate I I truly applaud the work that you've been able to do because my assumption on this and you can correct me if I'm wrong but you probably could have created a business that worked within the the normal realms of farming and not gone out and and been a bit of a, a specialist in this region agriculture and probably would have wouldn't have copped as much flack as you may have done by doing so and so I think you've put your neck out there and that's something to be applauded and um, respected absolutely well it's certainly been a lot of fun so uh no problem at all but uh you know it's just about people wanting to do the right thing long term and you know that really is what regen eggs about and, and making a positive change so you know i hope everyone stays safe through the the corona era um and um you know i think it's it's time we can use the time that we have but be quieter to reflect on some of these things and you know we don't have to go back to the way things were, we can go forward to a new future. And I think that's what we should be doing, that if anything good comes out of these times, it's it's a chance to reflect and redesign and regenerate. Beautifully put, mate. Thanks so much for your time, Mark. No worries. Awesome. Good on you. Thanks very much. Thanks for the chat. See you soon. See you later. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it, guys. A conversation with Mark Gardner about regenerative agriculture. Now, there was a lot in that, and I am so grateful for Mark for his time. And I'm so grateful that there is a way that we can make some small changes and create big changes in the world that we live in. And I really think the, the methodologies that Mark speaks about will go a long way to helping us in this crisis that is the climate emergency. I really appreciate um, all the people out there that are thinking about these new ways of working the land and thinking about new ways of going about their daily life, whether it's through the food they eat or the way they go about reducing their waste. So a big shout out to anyone out there who is doing that. We really appreciate it. There's a lot we can do and there is a way that we can all make a really small contribution that's gonna lead to a very, very big change. Just a really heartfelt thank you for anyone who is taking the time to do that. Um, reach out to us at Stokely Podcast. And uh, yeah, until next time, take care of yourselves. Health really does start from within. So please look after yourself in this time. Until next time, thanks a lot for listening to Stokely. We really appreciate it. And bye for now.